Thank you all and good afternoon. Thank you all for joining us on the second FFVT on point. My name is Abdurrahman Ahmed and I am the director of the Institute of Migration Studies at Chikchiga University. Um, before I start the event, maybe I would like to ask um, the panelists is also to turn on their videos. So for those of you who might not know um, about FFET, FFET is a cooperation project that supports the networking of institutions and researchers working on the topic of forced migration. It's funded by the German Ministry of Education and Research and jointly implemented by the German Development Institute. Bonn International Center for Conflict Studies, Center for Human Rights, Erlangen Nuremberg, and the Institute of Migration and Intercultural Studies. In today's discussion, we will follow, uh, we will focus on the situation of forced displacement, as well as the durable solutions for both IDPs and refugees in Ethiopia with uh, four experts and colleagues from academic and research institutions in Ethiopia. I welcome Alemu Asfaw, Mahider Warkene, Ricardo Adunya, and Asra Sain Brahanu. Thank you all very much for agreeing to contribute to this session as a panelist. Um, I will introduce each of you uh, briefly and shortly before um, your presentations. <clears throat> But before that, I would like to share some housekeeping rules for the participants and of course for the panelists. So the participants will be able to ask questions through the Q and A function, at the bottom of your screen um, during the whole webinar. Uh, make sure that you address your questions to a resp uh, respective speaker or speakers uh, that you want to ask the question. <clears throat> After the discussion, uh, we will be able to select these questions together with my colleague, Marx uh, Rudolf, and we will discuss the questions with the panelists. The event will not address um, issues that are not related to the topic of discussion. So we will kindly ask the participants to make sure that the questions are not out of the topic of discussion, which is on the theme, forced migration and durable solutions in Ethiopia. Um, <clears throat> This webinar is also recorded and it will be shared on FFET YouTube channel later on. Now, before I um, go to the panelists, I would like to kind of share with you a brief context of the forced migration situation in Ethiopia uh, to give an overview of the context that we are talking about to the participants. And then we will go to the panelists for the main discussion points. So Ethiopia has faced a multiple crisis in recent years, including the old conflicts along the ethnic boundaries, which you find in almost all of its regional state borders, climate shocks, mainly in the form of drought that affect pastoralist communities living in the lowlands of Ethiopia, which also uh, represent a good share of the population of Ethiopia, and also new conflicts mainly, which have taken place in the northern part of Ethiopia, between the TPLF and the federal government. These crises have led to the worsening situation of the forced migrants in Ethiopia. And since 2016, the, um, Ethiopia, the numbers of IDPs in Ethiopia has increased in an unprecedented manner, putting Ethiopia on the top list of IDP hosting countries in the world. While conflict and drought have been the main factors affecting or um, causing um, the search of IDP numbers in Ethiopia since 2016, the recent war in Tigray uh, uh, in the northern part of Ethiopia has also produced uh, one of the largest numbers of IDPs, mainly in Tigray, Amhara, and Afar regional states in Ethiopia. As a result of this, the numbers of IDPs in Ethiopia uh, have increased from 2.1 million in late 2020 when the conflict erupted to an estimated 4.2 million recently, which is almost a 100% increase. Uh, on the other hand, Ethiopia is a major refugee hosting country. And by the end of 2021, Ethiopia was hosting over 800,000 refugees and asylum seekers. Majority of these refugees are hosted in more than 20 camps 
located in the border areas of four developing regions within Ethiopia that are characterized by harsh weather, poor development indicators, and low administrative capacities. Some of the refugees have been living in this situation for more than 30 years with limited access to services. Despite maintaining an open tour policy to the refugee inflows and even recording refugee arrivals in 2021, the recent conflict in the North has not only worsened the situation of some of the refugees in the conflict affected areas, but also displaced around 60,000 refugees, Ethiopian refugees in Sudan. So as far as the durable solutions are concerned, in an attempt to improve the lives and livelihoods of the forcibly displaced population, Ethiopia has endorsed the New York Declaration in 2016 and then developed the Comprehensive Refugee and Response Framework in 2017 as to how they wanted to engage refugees, uh, integrate refugees locally, uh, but also how far rights the government is willing to extend to the refugees. Moreover, Ethiopian parliament has passed a comprehensive refugee law, which was considered to be one of the most progressive uh, refugee policies in Africa in early 2021. For the IDPs, on the other hand, Ethiopia has launched the Durable Solutions Initiative with the aim to promote a conducive conditions for the IDPs and host communities in late 2019, somewhere December. In early, um, continuing to these efforts, in early 2020, Ethiopia also has ratified the African Union Convention for the Protection and Assistance of Internal Displaced Persons in Africa, commonly known as the Kampala Convention, to protect and resolve the plight of IDPs in its borders. So in today's session, we will discuss how far has this durable solution plans for the forcibly displaced been able to record an improvement in the lives and the livelihoods of IDPs and refugees in Ethiopia, what are the reasons is slowing the concrete efforts to implement these plans and what needs to be done to keep the wheels turning towards the right direction with the four experts I have mentioned earlier. Now I will come to the panelists and <clears throat> our first panelist will be um, Alemu Asfaw. I'll introduce shortly Alemu Asfaw and the point of discussion. Alemo Asfaw is an assistant professor in the Department of Political Science and International Studies at Fahedtar University, Ethiopia. His main area of research interests include migration and forced displacement, which covers both IDBs and um, refugees, political economy and identity politics. Currently, Alemo is doing his PhD on refugee flow and Ethiopian state response. Alemo would share with us uh, <laughs> issues revolving around the durable solutions initiative for the internal displaced people in Ethiopia, where we are with it, the progress achieved, and, and how it is going. Alemu, uh, the floor is yours. You are muted, I think, Alemu, so you can unmute yourself. So I was talking. Uh, uh, thank you, Abdurrahman, for the nice introduction. And then uh, nice to meet you all. Um, so I think I, I'm giving like five, six minutes to discuss this point. Uh, it's a bit difficult for me to cover um, Chad's IDP governance situation given uh, its um, massive massiveness. So, but, but again, I've tried to, to discuss a few points. So in terms of my presentation, I've got um, like uh, three major points of discussion. One is a overview of Ethiopia's IDP situation, uh, and also the second is on IDP's governance and response, and the last one will be on limitation of this governance and response structure. And finally, if I have got the time on, conclusion will be made. So in terms of overview, uh, right now we see Ethiopia being one of the most, I would say, IDP producers in the world. Uh, we have got like 5.8 million IDPs as of like February 14, 2022. That's huge number, especially this has been argumented by the current conflict in the north and then the whole, uh, I think, issue around the neighboring regions and then also the prior number of refugees uh, in the other parts of the country. So here I try to focus on what has been the major so drivers of uh, this conflict, I mean, this IDP. So when I see all of these uh, numbers, usually all of them have been somehow caused by conflict 
and climate, but the majority have been again caused by conflicts. Uh, so we can call them that they're, they're basically conflicts and displacement uh, situations right now happening in the country. Just to mention some of them from almost uh, since uh, Abi came to power, we see this number you know, going up, uh, starting with the Somali Oromia region interregion conflict with the Gedeo Guji, again with Somali region, the Chika town, with the Amara command, Benishan Gumuz between the Gumuz and Amara around uh, uh, in that region, again with, within the Gumuz and Oromo again within Benishan Gul. Uh, and finally, the major has been between the federal government and the PLF. Of course, we have got other evidence, sort of uh, incidents in uh, Western Wadlaga, Eastern Wadlaga, and then also disputes between Afar and Somali region. So these are huge um, events where you can see a recurrence of IDPs and conflicts causing this huge number uh, to this day. So in terms of what has been causing them, so I, I have got like, you know, uh, two points here. One is the root cause and one the triggering cause. If you see all of them, they have got one sort of uh, root cause. All of them, they come down to the structure of the federal system. But again, all of them are caused by a bit of a different triggering factor, uh, like territorial claims, the quest for separate administrative status, competition of resources, security imperatives of regional governments. All of them, they have got different sort of thing, but again, they boil down to one major thing, a structural issue with the system, what we have right now. And they also, Second one with the capacity of the current government seen as weak and also unwilling sometimes to do and to answer the problem. So, in terms of uh, seeing the governance, then I think uh, you have got the past and the current one. In the past, IDPs were not in usually uh, seen as an issue, a data where they can be you know, easily handled. And special recognition of the conflict uh, caused IDPs has been totally ignored in the past. And that's because of the image that uh, it was uh, assumed to cause on the country, like as a bad image. And this has been, you know, somehow leading the government focus on more of deterrence and containment of internal displacement, like immediate return of IDPs to their area of origin, and sometimes, you know, prevention of documentation of, you know, IDP crisis, like by blocking humanitarian observers to some, you know, areas not to be visited. In short, in the past, you could say there was somehow there is deinstitutionalization of IDP situation, not giving proper legal framework and not, not providing them with you know, the protections they need. Uh, that was an issue. Um, but of course, there was some development in the past, like the ninth set introduction of the national prevention preparedness strategy, 1993 introduction of the disaster prevention and management policy, 1995, again, establishment of the disaster prevention and preparedness commission. Again, in 2013, we see the development of the national policy strategy on disaster and risk management. This has been key developed in the past, but again, there was no comprehensive recognition of the IDP crisis and then the policy framework are just addressing them. So what we see again, since 2018 with the coming of a new government, a change of policy and approach towards, you know, governing IDP crisis. It began with the recognition of the, the, the crisis and the adoption of, you know, sort of solution. In terms of legal framework, we see uh, what Abdul Rahman said earlier, uh, the ratification of the Kampala Convention in uh, 2020, what we call the Convention for the Protection and Assistance of Internal Displacement Persons in Africa. And this was one, because this ratification honestly entails lots of things. One, it entailed recognition of all forms of you know, IDP situation, including you know, conflict induced ones. Two, again, it's all about it shows the evidence of internal displacement in the country. And the third one was the government's you know, readiness to address the specific vulnerabilities of IDP. So this legal framework has been somehow important for the country in terms of IDP. Again, there is the institutional sort of response. Uh, the, almost uh, there was this National Disaster Management Commission, but now because of this high number of um, uh, IDPs coming from conflict zones, then Minister of Peace also is involved or has been involved uh, in this response. So it somehow combines legal authority with again uh legal authority on the co uh, climate change one plus again with the uh, emerging conflict idp situation in the country even if it's not supported by law for the institution so in terms of response mechanism there are two things response mechanism and response plan in terms of the mechanism so you have got like coordination the management system what you, what we see right now in the case is the cluster approach where you have got you know different you know emergency humanitarian situation stance given 
in an organized manner by coordinating with the government and UNGs and also, you know, other NGOs. So it's somehow, you know, clustered along, you know, like you know, food, wash, sanitation, lots of, you know, issues. And where you have got different actors leading each of these clusters. And again, which is a coming of what you call peace strategy in 2019. Especially this one was tailored for the Oromo and Somali regional conflict situation. And then we see again the, the coming of uh, the National Steering Committee, which is somehow included, included the National Disaster Management Commission. But again, you have got the structure at, at federal level. Uh, again, below it, you have got a ministerial committee task force leading. And then again, below it, you have got again each different cluster. Uh, you know, towards uh, the local government also participating in the whole response mechanism. So at national level, you can see a new body acting uh, to the response. Um, in terms of response plan and measure, there are two answers or responses. One is, you know, providing emergency or life-saving assistance. And second is just bringing door solution. I think the main thing here to talk about is the door solution, the DSI, door solution initiative. When talk about this initiative, this one is huge uh, in terms of the concept and then in terms of the practice. So the idea with role is there are three options, just like you know, a refugee response. There are three options here again for road solution initiative for IDP. One is either to tell them uh, area of origin or to give them the chance for local integration in the area of displaced or a relocation to another area. And this is supposed to be somehow, you know, area-based, uh, government-led, committee-driven initiative with the involvement actors from the government and government, and it's supposed to be, you know, policy-driven, initial-driven, and also, you know, IDP-friendly somehow, solution and planning. Um, and if, if you see the whole idea behind Global Solution Initiative, the SI, then, um, and it's not simply, you know, some kind of, you know, simple return or location of IDPs. For, for those solution is supposed to be, you know, uh, uh, complemented with uh, the addressing of the root cause of the issue, and then no more, you know, there, there should be no more any cause that can somehow cause any conflict or displacement after that. Uh, that's the idea. So uh, that's the idea behind the drone solution, and then you have got the basic framework coming from the intelligence standing committee IASC framework, uh, you know, as part of framing it. Um, and then when we talk, talk about DSI, there are parameters. How do we measure the success of this uh, or failure of this DSI? There are, you know, eight parameters uh, divided by the intelligence uh, standing committee. One is security, two is access to social provision, and three, access to employment and livelihood, four, housing, land and property, uh, five, documentation, six, family unification, seven is participation in public affairs, and then the last eight is remedies for displacement related violations. So it's supposed to be then based on this sort of eight criteria, whether you have got a successful or a failed, you know, road solution uh, practice for the IDPs. Of course, again, on this part, uh, which uh, I work with at the moment, they try to somehow downsize these eight into three categories. They put them as, you know, physical safety, material safety, and legal safety. So the eight criteria can be brought under, you know, three major uh, criteria to, to check or test whether you know any solution uh, is drawable uh, solution. Now that being the case, uh, in my reading, I came to see limitation in terms of you know the IDP governance and application. One is it's in terms of institution. What we see right now is fragmented and decentralized sort of system, where you have got you know the National Disaster Management Commission one, but again this National Commission is not really the national human rights because you have got the play, uh, sort of confidence in this uh, IDPs, which are not, you know, under its purview by law. Then you see again the coming of Minister of Peace, you know, supporting that as some kind of, you know, uh, ad hoc response to it. So that's one issue. The second is, you know, um, you have got again this sort of federal and sort of regional, even local arrangement of uh, solutions, which sometimes can be done by themselves. Example, if you take the case of Somali region, they have got their own multi stakeholder, you know, pro solution working group. Which is new for the country. Uh, that's that's my reading, you know. And then you have got also a zonal response, where you have seen uh, in the last town uh, because of the Bido and the Guji sort of you know conflict. So you have got diverse of responses, which are a bit fragmented and hard you know, to follow. That's one limitation in terms of you know the institution. 
Um, so in terms of again, a response, that's where you can see huge gap uh, today. And the response, like I said earlier, there are two types, emergence and road solution. But again, both have got, you know, problems. So far in my reading, I can see problems as it with both of them. For example, you know, IDPs faced you know, huge challenges while in displacement and even after into their area of origin. And second is the government has been so much interested in returning IDPs, you know, in the, uh, other than, you know, shaping the other sort of possibilities for even relocation or even local integration. Example, you know, in the 2020s, I am sort of displacement uh, track, uh, uh, I think, matrix sort of solution. They found out like, you know, 72% people to be interested in local integration. We have got again 15% interested in relocation, while only 13% in return. Even if you have got this sort of number, sort of, you know, data, the government is still opted for the last one, the return, which is like 13%, which again can tell you, you know, the consequence because of this unwillingness. Then what happened here? People were forced somehow to return, even in a premature, you know, uh, situation, even against their will, and even against, you know, the instrument is set out by uh, uh, by the international body, uh, like the parameter earlier. Again, what happens because because they are forced, then because things are not done at home, you know, at the areas where they're supposed to be, you know, uh, sort of settled, then there you can see secondary displacement taking place, you know, as a, a common occurrence. I need to thank it. Again, this again has been also somehow, you know, uh, forcing the government to do some kind of negative re reinforcement is like, you know, denial of recognition of, you know, status of displacement. By denying them, you deny them in access to food and shelter, you know, and then you force them to go. Or even sometimes, you know, you somehow, you know, withheld the food, then you make them return. So this sort of thing has been one uh, sort of case uh, in terms of, you know, a setback. Another one has been, you know, like, uh, you know, allocation of food aid wasn't even sufficient. They have got huge number of IDPs right now, but insufficient food is right now available. And also you have got, you know, uh, food aid being given irrespective of the IDP's family size. So I've got huge uh, family size or small, it doesn't matter. You know, the allocation was not, you know, uh, proportional to the family size. And sometimes you might, uh, I don't know, discover uh, in your, in your also sort of, uh, the study of IDPs where you have got, you know, assistance given to non IDP situation while IDP ones have been somehow, you know, blocked because of some local authorities and because of some political interests, which I think has been secretly uh, with the KDOA, Buji, and then I think that the sort of, you know, the 2018, 2019 sort of uh, return and then operations in Ethiopia. So that's one thing. Um, again, because of this sort of problem, almost the government has been somehow, you know, conflicting with even with the international institution. And the international community has not been happy with the, with the way the government, you know, handling the situation. Um, so even sometimes, some of them, they call them, it's a shameful, it's inhuman sort of treatment and the like. So you can see some kind of, you know, unhappiness from the, uh, the international community side in the way the or how the government handled uh, the situation. So even they demanded you know, the government to be somehow turning IDPs you know, to be on like, you know, a pragmatic and principled approach, which again is, you know, uh, difficult um, at the moment. So uh, in conclusion, so what's being done by the government or as a whole KPI in terms of uh, dual solution is simply superficial. That doesn't resolve the elephant in the room. That is the underlying structural political system, which is, ethnic federal structure, which as to me is the main uh, cause of all this conflict in IDPs in the country. So the problem has lingered until now, and then unless it's somehow addressed, then you cannot really have a you know, solution because you will see again another IDP formation coming up. Of course, IDP is or is, uh, IDP is uh, on, on the horizon right now. So the second in terms of the compact uh, completion, we need to properly domestic the completion into Ethiopia and then somehow do, you know, the proper implementation of that. Uh, finally, given Ethiopia sort of IDP and the whole for this person structure, you have got refugees, you have got IDPs, you have got returnees from outside. Again, I've got hostess, all of them, sometimes hard to classify who is who. So there has to be a, a, a policy somehow to follow, area-based policy, which can somehow, you know, cover or address these different types of, you know, vulnerabilities and then 
uh, that should be I think, the approach. So thank you very much. Thank you very much, um, Alemo Asfal. I mean, you have raised quite a wonderful point and we have, of course, issues to follow up later. But given the time also, I will now um, proceed to the next um, panelist. So our next panelist is uh, Fakadu Adunya. Um, I will briefly introduce him and then the topic that he's going to share with us. So Dr. Fakadu Adunya is an associate professor of social anthropology at Addis Ababa University. His research area of interest includes migration, forced displacement and refugees, borderlands, identity issues, uh, identity studies and conflict. He has coordinated and co-led several research projects on the topics that we have mentioned in the Horn of Africa. Currently, he is a country coordinator for traffic project on Eritrean refugees and protracted displacement economy study, which, fo which focuses on the Somali refugees in Ethiopia. Uh, based on um, his research experience, Dr. Fekadu uh, will share with us the durable solutions for the refugees. Um, since we have talked about the durable solutions for the internal displacement in detail, now we will uh, see uh, where we are with the CRRF uh, based on uh, Dr. Fakadu's research. Dr. Fakadu uh, is maybe facing some uh, technical glitch and we may not see him uh, because of his you know, video is not working, but Dr. Fakadu, the floor is yours and let's um, maybe consider also the timing. Thank you. Uh, thank you very much, Abdurrahman, for the introduction. Uh, well, as you said, I'm, I'm, I'm really sorry for the technical problem. Uh, I thought it, it, is, it has been fixed, but again, the video failed uh, for a second time. So uh, I'm forced to talk uh, in the dark. Uh, but, I mean, yes, uh, I'm not that much prepared to make a uh, uh, a conventional presentation, uh, but um, I'm ready to answer questions. But I, I give some introductory remarks on on refugee governance and then the, the CRRF, as, as Abdurrahman mentioned. Uh, yes, I've, I've been uh, part of the traffic project where we studied with other colleagues and, and the Marcus Rudolph, who is among us. We studied Eritrean refugees uh, from from 2019 until 2000. Immediately until I mean before we ended with field field work immediately before the conflict in northern Ethiopia, and currently I'm also undertaking, as Sabdraman said, uh, a project protracted displacement economy, uh, focusing on the economy of the refugees. Uh, especially among among Somali refugees. So my my introductory remark is based on my engagement is in these two two projects. Uh, in terms of refugee governance, one could say that there is a major shift in refugee governance regime in Ethiopia in the last 12, 13 years. Uh, the first refugee uh, proclamation was endorsed in 2004, which is almost 20 years ago. And that proclamation mainly focused on protection, encampment, and humanitarian aid. Again, this proclamation, which I said, uh, a shift, in 2010, the Ethiopian government developed out-of-camp policy for Eritrean refugees uh, on, on the condition that the refugees can have a guarantor and they can survive without asking for, for any support or for forfeiting their, their support from UNHCR and the Ethiopian government. Uh, then Ethiopian refugees are by then, especially before the peace deal, of the 2018, Eritrean refugees were uh, young, single, and have urban background. And they also belong to, or they share one of the mainstream languages in Ethiopia, Tigrinya, 
so that they were considered culturally part of Ethiopia and they can survive in Ethiopian urban space uh, without demanding for support. But also until the change of government, Ethiopian, I mean, Ethiopian refugees were politically the most favored refugees you see, with, with, those ad, with, with those advantage. Then in 2016, as, as uh, Abdraman also mentioned, uh, there was this New York summit. Uh, that came when Europe was in the so-called uh, refugee crisis. And the Ethiopian government was also constructing a number of industrial parks and looking for international support. Uh, thus, there was mutual uh, interest in engaging, uh, I mean, Ethiopia is also the second refugee hosting country next to Uganda in Africa. So engaging in uh, the global refugee forum and becoming a very active player in refugee in the summit, including making uh, the nine place which was mentioned uh, before. And that was a mutual understanding between Ethiopian government and, and the international uh, communities. Then based on that, Ethiopian government made this nine place, which are again against the proclamation Ethiopia was using, the 2004 proclamation. Uh, among the points which are most important in the place where expansion of out of camp policy to benefit 10% of the total refugee population, pro provide work permits to refugees, increase the enrollment of refugee children in school at different uh, level, make 10,000 hectares of irrigable land available to enable 20,000 refugees and the host community households. Uh, and a low local integration of refugees. And uh, also work with industrial partners to build industrial parks and employ uh, up to 100,000 individuals, where 30% of it was reserved for refugees. Uh, then the Daza was also documentation of refugees, including uh, accessing bank, bank accounts, buying. Uh, telecommunication SIM card is uh, and, the, and, the, and the vital registration and so on. So, which means Ethiopian government radically changed its approach to, to refugees. Uh, then in this situation, CRRF was considered uh, to be an instrument to support the implementation of this nine place. And interestingly, even Ethiopian government committed itself to be a pilot country for CRRF in 2017. Uh, then, which means Ethiopian government against, against its own proclamation has increasingly sought a more sustainable response that goes beyond the care and the maintenance of refugees, which was the focus of the 2004 proclamation to promote refugee, mo refugee mobility, refugees participation in the economy, and refugees supporting the refugees endeavor toward the self reliance. Then, interestingly, again, this approach combines wider support for host communities. That's why, see, it was very much welcomed by Ethiopian government and, and the wider population. Then, in 2018, there came this change of government followed by internalized crimes, which, which Alam was talking about, and the, the bigger conflict in the North, and the COVID-19, all of them contributed in complicating the implementations of CRRF and the other uh, endeavors. Of course, the government, government also complained that as a result of the conflict and, and the COVID-19, international community also failed to fulfill its commitment uh, towards the implementation of, of CRRF. But on, po on, the, on the positive side, the government at least working on most crucial legal policy frameworks. See, the 2019 proclamation, very progressive proclamation, which was in support of CRRF and other uh, 
uh, initiatives. Then there are a number of directives to implement the, the, the proclamation that are all uh, prepared. And the 2019 proclamation committed uh, to delivering the nine sets of pledges I, I mentioned above. Uh, among, among the pledges, at least, now refugees can register births and the marriage. They can open bank accounts. They can buy SIM cards. Uh, right to work, the residence permit, lower, lowering income, a number of income, income refugees. These are not uh, implemented. But recently, I'm just coming back from a field work in a Dolo Addo refugee camp in, in, in Somali region. And I uh, observed that there are activists to give resident permits to few refugees who are involving, who are actively involving in joint uh, projects with the host. Uh, there are cooperatives which are established by by ARA, but I mean involving both refugees and, and the hostess. So like up to three, three, three to four thousand refugees are now uh, in the process of being given uh, residence permits. Uh, so th these are uh, positive initiatives. Then coming to local integration, which uh, Abdurrahman uh, mentioned uh, before, the government promised to locally integrate refugees who spent over 20 years in the country. But so far, uh, how to implement that by government from above uh, is, is a big, I mean, would be the biggest challenge. We have, we have not seen any activity toward that implementation, but one would uh, assume that it would be one of the one of the one of the big challenges. In our experiences, uh, studying the Eritrean refugees, uh, especially uh, Afar refugees, and my recent visit to Somalia, I mean uh, Somali region uh, in Dolo Addo, uh, we have, I mean, we have actually we have we have also uh, published a working paper on 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 the on the Eritrean refugees how local solidarity predicated on common history, common culture, uh, support the Afar refugees from, from Eritrea uh, to local integrate and secure livelihood. The magnitude of that local integration might not be too big uh, to say a, or to take it as a durable solution. Uh, and the same thing is happening among Somali refugees in Del Lado, where uh, in this case, many thousand Somali refugees are locally integrating through local social structure, so local clan structure. And the good, uh, I think the advantage they, they got is the availability of uh, a very big, potentially big irrigable land and the refugees' knowledge from, from their background as agriculturalists in southern Somalia. Now, I mean, if there are support from, from above. There is also private uh, initiative, especially IKEA Foundation has uh, built a big uh, irrigation canal, but also the people themselves are accessing as uh, locally localized uh, socially based, clan based uh, initiatives, especially in, in the areas of agriculture and other businesses. So my advice to, 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 to the policymakers is, instead of pushing from above, the local integration could come by building on what is going on, uh, I mean, within the communities and build on that uh, integration from below. Thank you very much, and uh, I'll come back for questions and answers. Thank you very much, uh, Dr. Fakadu. These are key important points, I think, which few of them we will follow up as additional points, but then definitely the questions and answers will also revolve around to this point. Um, our next panelist will be um, Mahida Rorkine, and 
just to briefly introduce Mahider, he's joining us from uh, the Institute of Peace and Security Studies at Addis Ababa University. And her research is focused on the forced displacement and resistance to development as one of the durable solutions in Ethiopia. Spe specifically, the focus for her research is in the Gambela region, west of Ethiopia. She has an experience in, uh, of working in support of protection to forcibly displace it, uh, people in Ethiopia. And the point of discussion will revolve around, uh, we know the refugee policy and, and the CRRF and the local integration in Ethiopia from this perspective, which uh, seems to be like it's more conducive, it's more positive. But however, in some areas, there is uh, an interesting, uh, maybe also a uh, point of discussion, which is, uh, the, there is a resistance from the local uh, communities to uh, these international norms. Maider will share with us a few points on, on this. Maider, the floor is yours. Thank you very much, Abdirahman. Um, <clears throat> so um, I thank all panelists for the previous sessions uh, and uh, as it fits on the introduction and the introductory uh, part of what CRF is, I will not go to that part. Um, my study uh, focuses on uh, the local resistance to development. Uh, development is uh, an, a normally a global um, idea uh, and it is usually to support the poor countries and uh, to bring knowledge and development uh, in the sense of education, services, uh, good governance, um, uh, and all those necessary uh, basic uh, things for um, for development. Um, in my study, I, I have uh, observed that in Gambella region, uh, as you know, Gambella is one of the 10th regional governments in Ethiopia. Uh, and uh, within Gambella, they are divided among five ethnic groups. Uh, and from those uh, five ethnic groups, two of them are the majority, the Anua and the Nwer. And uh, in addition to the five uh, indigenous local groups, uh, there are uh, the Highlanders, which are, uh, which is a term that is usually used only in Gambela to mean, um, to mean Ethiopians that come for economic or settled, settled lives um, in Gambela. There was a resettlement scheme back in the 1980s to mitigate drought. And then uh, there were a few Ethiopians that were settled there. And then there are those who have settled there from Dambidolo, Jima, and um, all parts of Ethiopia for economic purposes. So um, from this, uh, we can understand the dynamics is we have different languages. We have different ethnic groups that exist in, in the region. And on top of that, we have uh, South Sudanese refugees that make the majority of the, 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 the demography of the area. So currently the demography of the South Sudanese refugees is more than the local uh, uh, population. Uh, so while this is the background that we have, uh, we have um, the development projects that such as the comprehensive refugee response framework that has been um, that has been piloted in Ethiopia, um, like um, our previous presenter who has experience in Somali region. Somali is uh, one of the most studied areas in regards to CRRF because there is better integration in regards to language and ethnic groups, uh, and division is more around clan division rather than ethnic division. Uh, but in Gambela, the divisions are mostly um, it on, uh, on uh, ethnic lines. Um, so <laughs> the dynamics is quite complex. So, um, so on my study, I used uh, theories um, of the Jewish American professor, Roger S. Gottlieb, who defines resistance as a phenomena that exists in a state of oppression within a power relation on a, of an oppressor and an oppressed. Uh, and then there's also James Scott, who defines it as a virtual OSS stratagem deployed by a weaker party in, the, in thwarting the claims of institutional or class opponents who dominate the public exercise of power. So this means um, that in resistance, there's always power dynamics in play. And in uh, situations where we have different ethnic groups and different uh, 
political um, um, struggles on the ground, there's always some sort of resistance from one group or the other. So my study uh, is to understand what the resistance are on government level and in, on, in the community levels. And uh, are those resistances experienced like in the everyday uh, sense of resistance or are they violent? Because uh, the region is quite also um, uh, sometimes depicted as, um, as you know, uh, ethnically um, violent uh, ethnic clashes has been registered and recorded in the past. Between, mostly between the Anua and the Nuer, but of course there has been ethnic clashes between the Anua and the Highlanders as well. Deridre Fayisa, who has studied uh, in depth the, the, uh, the ground and the history of um, this dynamics, uh, states it um, from its historical um, start on how this has evolved through time. Uh, but for, for because we don't have time, uh, I will just say that um, my point is to understand if the development theories that we have to implement the CRRF project uh, is enough uh, to, um, to win the identity politics that we have on ground. Um, because when we come to identity politics, uh, sometimes uh, economic uh, theories don't always um, um, take, the, take the winning hand and identity kind of takes over usually uh, from few readings that I have seen so far. So my studies, if that is the case uh, that we have in regards to CRRF uh, in Gambela region. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, Maida, for these um, key points you have shared. Um, I would like to remind the participants that the question and answer session is um, uh, and the, maybe at the bottom of your screen, is active and you can share the questions that you have for the uh, panelists anytime. Now we will go to our um, fourth panelist, uh, Asrasani Burhanu. Asrasani is a senior lecturer and researcher at Deborah Marcos University in Ethiopia. His research interest is focused on local integration of refugees, refugee host relations, conflict resolution, and human rights. Currently, he is a PhD. Uh, he is doing his PhD research at the Institute of Peace and Security Studies of Addis Ababa University on the integration of refugees and the conflict uh, with the host community in, in, in Gambele area of Ethiopia. Asra Sahin is also um, FFET research fellow at Bonn International Center for Conflict Studies. He will share with us the factors. I mean, we have, we have been talking about so far um, the durable solutions uh, initiative uh, policies in general. Uh, the, the refugee policies, and, and we have seen that uh, to some extent there's just um, is low in the implementation of these policies, uh, and for them to bring uh, deliver results. So we will talk uh, with Asra Sahani about those factors that are contributing to, you know, this low motion of these uh, policy implementations in Ethiopia. Asra Sahani, uh, the floor is yours. You are muted, I think, as sign. You can unmute. I can hear me. Thank you, Abdi, uh, for, the, for uh, your introduction. And I would like to thank you, the uh, first presenter, Alamu, uh, Dr. Kadu, and uh, Mada. I am going to just focus on the problems or the challenges that have. Uh, a great impact on CRRF and durable solution initiative or DSI. I think that a lot of uh, issues are discussed by those participants or panelists. I would like, uh, I don't want to repeat those discussion or points raised by those uh, panelists, but I will limit uh, my uh, focus on the real problems and challenges that are really hindering and impeding the CRRF and uh, Durable Solution Initiative. Actually, my, my research is on local integration of conflict, uh, integration and conflict in Gambilla, but I have, uh, they were all understanding or they were all uh, pointers with regard to integration CRRF or 
TSI. So in this regard, I will focus mainly on those uh, factors. When we talk about uh, CRRF, local integration or DSI, the main, the, main, the main aim or objective is to make those refugees or protected refugees and protected uh, displaced persons uh, self, uh, to make them self reliable or to in order to at least make them that can feed or can make their own future or to just uh, from from the point of human rights and one in one thing it is it is from human rights pers perspective or from human rights point of view those uh, refugees who have lived more than two decades have the right to be integrated and to have uh, access to basic uh, rights like education and so on. So in that way, we will talk about CRRF and local integration, but uh, are we in, in the right position to just meet that objective and aim in Ethiopia and across the world? From that uh, point of view, I will divide the main factors into two uh, groups, the internal factors and the external factors. Uh, with regard to the internal factors, those are factors mainly uh, internal problems that have a direct and indirect effect on the implementation of CRRF and uh, at those initiatives, different initiatives like durable initiative. Uh, the first uh, internal factor, for example, the political factor, we can see the political factor and socio-economic factor. In the first uh, category that is political factor, we can uh, raise uh, different localized uh, conflicts or uh, might be, we can call also a war, you know? And different, if you go to different, or when we go to uh, local, local uh, conflicts or to the community level, you can have a lot of conflict among and between groups. It might be uh, ethnic groups or it might be a clan a line conflict is uh, so those conflicts are recurrent conflicts that have a great impact on CRF implementation. We are going to just realize CRRF or whatever uh, based on those local realities, or we are going to take this reality into account. And when you take this uh, realities, conflicts always live with uh, this community or they are living with conflict, you can say that. So one of the, the main criteria to achieve integration in CRRF is peace and security, but we are not maintaining that peace and security in the local and at the greater level, it is also, uh, there is also war. At the same time, war is uh, you know, producing, conflict is producing IDP. And on the other hand, we are also talking about uh, solution for the IDP. So war, or local conflict is nowadays basic uh, major uh, problem that are directly affecting CRRF implementation. You cannot talk about CRRF and local integration while our community is living with this kinds of environment. There, there is insecurity. Uh, insecurity in different parts of uh, Ethiopia is also a major threat that is uh, uh, boldly seen for the last, um, I mean, 10 or 20 years. The other one is also the contested structure, political structure nowadays. Amhari also said that it is, uh, might be a federal, uh, federal state structure or whatever. Those political lines are divided in terms of ethnic lines so that we're going to also uh, implement CRF and local integration based on these lines. And of course, if you're talking about uh, return or if you're talking about uh, relocation for the uh, IDPs, we are also considering this political structure. So we are looking this policy from the perspective of this uh, political structure or federal structure. We cannot ignore uh, the, the things that are, or the impacts that are uh, feasibly observed in different parts of Ethiopia. And the other one is uh, highly attached with politics or Ethiopian politics uh, is lack of clear ideology or political ideology. Unlike most uh, European states who have a very clear and defined political ideology, there is uh, their own clear political scene or ideology, or they are just considering this integration or local integration 
from their political point of view or from their political ideology. But in Ethiopia, we are in at, at least we are in infant stage, or we don't have at all. You know, so if you don't have a clear political ideology, uh, I don't see any political party talking about CRRF talking about the uh, DAS uh, either supporting or maybe favoring the CRRF. So in this case, we lack a lot uh, to support the CRRF in uh, DAS or initiatives. Uh, as a domestic political ideology. Even in the state level or as a government, I don't see any political ideology or philosophy to make this uh, RTLRS CRRF implementation or local integration. So, so these are the main, the main uh, flaws or uh, problems that have an impact on CRRF implementation that are, that are uh, directly or indirectly affect the CRRF. The other is uh, socioeconomic factors. And the uh, socioeconomic factors, the first one is unemployment and irregular economic activities. For instance, if we take the refugees or integrated refugees in the agriculture or irrigation or in the areas of uh, maybe industry, 30% or whatever. But uh, we need to be in the first instance uh, we need to be certain that our economy is, or our economic system can, can maintain these uh, activities, can hold these activities. If we see these uh, things, we are unable, or it seems unable at least, because of this irregular economic system activity, there is a great uh, unemployment rate. Now, the local committee and the host committees are suffering with this problem, so that uh we cannot we cannot uh we cannot be uh, as such uh, certain to make a progress or to make uh, a certain a certain result with regard to integration and so on so these are uh, greatly uh, affecting the implementation uh, for the last two years, uh, COVID-19 uh, was also the other uh, problem that affects the economic activities, uh, integration problem uh, activities, the communication among the between different stakeholders, including the government or mainstream, the government mainstreams or uh, uh, donors that are highly uh, hit by pandemic. And the deficiencies in terms of resource mobilization. The other most important uh, thing that we can uh, raise here is resource mobilization is a basic. In terms of uh, coordinating or in terms of you know facilitating those uh, multiple uh, activities, there must be a clear and you know strong uh, network of you know mobilizing resources. In this regard. There is a problem if you see or go to uh, visit those projects in Gambilla or in Somali, there is, you know, a huge gap or uh, problems, uh, clearly designed, you know, ways of communicating from one sector to other to other. So in this case, we cannot, we cannot uh, really talk about uh, realizing CRRF while we are just uh, we have a deficiency on resource mobilization. Uh, the other most important, thing, most important thing in terms of resource mobilization is, you know, sometimes there is overlapping of, uh, you know, government activities or the roles of the governments in terms of, you know, taking some roles. Uh, for example, there is overlapping of roles between the Minister of Education and the ARA for example, implementing education. So we're going to take over the, the responsibility of you now or in charge of facilitating the primary education in the uh, camp level or in the university level or in the college level. Is it the Ministry of Education or the ARA is going to uh, facilitate these things? Or So uh, the same is true in terms of you know, financing these activities. So there is no clear, really clear uh, way out of, or clearly clear mechanisms of mobilizing uh, resources to finance those projects or CRRF. 
uh, recurrent drought, disaster, or locust uh, infestation, and floods are also, uh, you know, unexpectedly affect our projects. We will plan to uh, to realize or to, to change into practice for five years or for four or three years, but and uh, unluckily it will be affected by those uh, drought or disaster. So it is also. Uh, one important problem. Uh, cultural disparity that I have observed in two uh, areas, for example, in Gambilla and in Afwa and Somali, there are, you know, disparities. Of course, the Eritrean refugees in, in, in Addis Ababa. There are conditions that can help refugees to integrate with uh, the community in terms of language similarity. But on the other hand, there is also a problem that refugees cannot uh, easily integrated into the host community because of this cultural disparity. You can take the Gambelans uh, who are struggling to integrate or to live with the civilized, uh, relatively civilized community in Addis Ababa. Or you can easily identify them uh, from the rest of uh, the host community. So these uh, disparities are also uh, one important uh, challenge that affect uh, CRRF. The external, uh, I will go to the external factors, uh, those factors that are coming from uh, regional, or it might be from the international community, or it might be from the regional community, or uh, might be. Uh, to list some of those uh, external factors, the first one is the diverse approach that stakeholders are implementing, or it might be ideological based or ideological driven approach to implement CRRF. And when talk about uh, self-driven, for example, why we need to talk about CRRF? If we study about the roles of, I mean, the driving, driving force to CRRF in local integration, uh, different states and groups can talk uh, based on their interests. And now Ethiopia has its own interests. For example, Dr. Uh, Afakadwa talked about it is a mutual interest because Ethiopia was in a position to uh, receive, you know, millions of uh, dollar, or it might be a currency problem, it might be, and their Westerns also needs to, you know, contain some 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 levels of, uh, you know, influx. So in that case, we, we may take that it is mutual interest. But when we come to a very specific activities uh, up to the local level, different uh, stakeholders or groups can can uh, come together with their own interest, you know. The regional governments have their own interest. The federal government has its own interest. Or different clan groups have their own interest, you know, looking this integration from their point of view, you know. In that regard, uh, it is it is difficult to bring all those uh, diversified interests or uh, different interests into one or uh, just to, to minimize that one thing. That there is uh, Transponder security threats. A transponder security threat, most of the time, those uh, CRRF implementation in the most remote areas are also affected by those uh, cross boundary or transboundary security. In Gambilla, it is also vulnerable. In Benishangul, it's also vulnerable uh, for such kinds of security threats. So, that is also one important thing that affects. Uh, CRRF. That is a uh, geopolitical dynamics. Yeah, uh, geopolitical dynamics, uh, for example, Ethiopia is uh, situated in a very uh, sensitive and ge geopolitically significant uh, area so that every uh, political and economic activities, including the refugees, are, are taken into consideration. All those different uh, interests are also entertained in that area or in the Horn of Africa. So, uh, for good or bad, you know, different uh, groups will take this opportunity for, uh, for, uh, for their own benefit. So uh, we, we need to also uh, think that that is also one important uh, effect or factor that affects indirectly or directly the CRF implementation. And the last one is uh, what we have observed since the last uh, one week in, in the international community is uh, political instability, we can say instability because most of uh, the CRRF 
and uh, the Rebel Fellowship Initiatives in Ethiopia and in different parts of Africa are financed by this international community, the EU, the United Nations, or United States, and many, many uh, international and governmental organizations that are originated in, in this uh, area are from those uh, Western uh, community. Now they are, uh, they are just uh, facing this political instability. In one or the other hand, it will, it will directly affect CRR uh, implementation. So these are uh, just to, to uh, give a brief uh, factors that affect CRRF implementation in Ethiopia. So I will back uh, for any indication. Thank you. Thank you very much. Um,